For nearly a century, a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee stood in Charlottesville, Virginia. In 1997, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which meant that at the time, and this again was in the 90s, so not all that long ago, it was considered worthy of preservation for both its, ar- its historical significance and its artistic value. A little over 20 years later, in the midst of public hysteria over the overdose death of a criminal drug addict in Minneapolis, that 100-year-old work of art, which was supposed to be preserved, was instead torn down. And we were told, move to a museum. Well, last week, the museum, in a symbolic humiliation ritual, melted the statue down and destroyed it. It will now be repurposed as an inclusive arts display. This is how we treat our art and our historic monuments these days. It's especially how we treat historical figures like Robert E. Lee. But it wasn't always this way. Going back now to the early to mid-19th century, for more than three decades during that span, Robert E. Lee served as an officer in the U.S. military. He graduated from West Point, uh, went on to play a key role in the Mexican-American War, which is a war that isn't talked about very much these days, even though it, it changed the country forever. And at the end of it, Mexico ceded a lot of territory, including California, Utah, Nevada, a lot of what we now call Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. And Lee's role in that victory earned him a series of major promotions. He was eventually named the superintendent of West Point, which was the military academy he once attended. Just a few years after Lee left that post, the state of Virginia, where Lee was born, seceded from the Union. And at that point, Lee had a decision to make. Okay, he could accept a post with the Union Army, leading the Union Army, in fact, which was offered to him by, by Lincoln, or he could defend his home state, which... And, 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 you know, if, if he decided to, uh, to take the other option and to join the Union, then he would be marching against his state, his community, his family, even his own sons. It would mean taking up the sword against his own family. Now, even though Lee was no great fan of either slavery or the idea of secession, he chose to defend his state and his family instead. In the end, he felt a greater loyalty to his state and to his community and to his family than he did to the federal government. And back in those days, that's how a lot of people felt. He resigned from the U.S. military, joined the Confederacy, and won some of the most pivotal battles of the war, often when he was up against very long odds. After the war, Lee became a college professor, and he worked to unify the North and South until his death. He was remembered across political lines for many, many decades as both an ingenious uh, tactician and a man of principle and faith. Churchill called him one of the best generals in history. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the President of the United States and former commander of Allied forces in Europe during World War II, had this to say about Robert E. Lee. Listen. I think uh, there are a good many of you people here, both photographers and and, uh, representatives of the press, have been going into my office for the past four and a half years, occasionally. No doubt you've noticed that on the wall there are the prints of four men. Men that I consider, in my book, are uh, about the four top Americans of the past. They are Franklin, Washington, Lincoln, and Lee. And anybody who ever tries to put me in any other uh, relationship with respect to General Lee is mistaken. (laughs) Now, a few years later, a dentist wrote to Eisenhower and uh, wrote a letter demanding to know why he had that picture of Robert E. Lee in his office. And this is part of Eisenhower's response. He said, quote, He believed unswervingly in the constitutional validity of his cause, which until 1865 was still an arguable question in America. He was a poised and inspiring leader. From deep conviction, I simply say, a nation of men of Lee's caliber would be unconquerable in spirit and soul. Now, for the next few decades, most Americans agreed with that assessment. In the 90s, we had movies venerating Robert E. Lee, starring Martin Sheen, and nobody lost their minds over it. The Lee statue and statues like it stood in town squares all over the country, especially in the South. It wasn't an issue. They weren't vandalized. There were no angry mobs demanding their removal. Most people, including those who certainly cannot be described as Confederate sympathizers, recognized that the Civil War was fought at a different time, in a different era, and there were noble men on either side. That's how most people viewed it for decades and decades. But somewhere along the line, in just the past few years, everything changed. Statues of Robert E. Lee and anyone like him had to come down, we were told. They had to come down right away. Okay, there was no time to talk about it. There was no time to debate. You weren't allowed to debate. In fact, you weren't even allowed to, uh, to, to express any of the viewpoints 
that nearly everyone held for a hundred years before that. These statues were not a problem for a hundred years, but in the last 100 seconds, they became a problem. And it was our duty to simply watch as they were all toppled and carried away. Now, already, if you're a perceptive and insightful person, you might ask yourself, was this a sign of progress? Like, was this a good sign when we started going around and had angry mobs tearing down all these statues that had been there for a century and nobody complained and then all of a sudden we had to take them on? Is this, was this a sign that the things were heading in a good direction in our country? Were we a better country back when a man like Robert E. Lee was widely respected? Or were we a better country when we decided that we could not have any acknowledgement of him in any public place? Which version of the country was better? Which version of the country had greater racial harmony? Was it the one back in the 90s when Robert E. Lee's statues were being preserved as historic monuments? Or the one in the 2020s? What do you think? Now, to make the contrast even more clear, the media did not elevate voices as articulate as Churchill or Eisenhower to make the case against the Robert E. Lee monuments. Instead, they thrust BLM activists like Zayana Bryant in our faces. And uh, here was her argument. This is from two years ago, talking about this same monument. Here's what she said. Zayana, I know you've heard this argument before. I'm, I'm hoping that you could go ahead and tell critics who feel like removing the statue is, is whitewashing history and a section of our history that we should be engaging with. Um, and, and by removing it, we're, we're acting as though uh, it didn't happen or, or we're trying to erase a section of our history. What do you say to those folks? I would say actually erecting these monuments is whitewashing our history. Um, at the time of emancipation, Charlottesville and the surrounding area was majority black. And you don't see that narrative by having Confederate monuments standing in the center of parks, towering over whole communities. What you see is you see a romanticized version of the South. You see um, memorabilia that makes people feel good about the Civil War. But it doesn't tell the story of the South losing. It doesn't tell the story of the Confederacy falling. Um, and so I think that we cannot erase history. We can't edit it. Um, in fact, history already happened. So people can Google, people can use textbooks. There are many other resources. There are whole museums that teach people um, about those legacies and about the history of what happened here. Um, but what I think we're doing with removing these statues is we're no longer offering a platform for white supremacy. And I think that by deplatforming um, and decentering those harmful narratives um, that perpetuate violence and that perpetuate oppression um, is one of the most powerful things that we can do. My Lord. So, again, ask yourself, are we a better country when people like that, when their arguments are prevailing, or when, you know, when, when we're uh, listening to Dwight D. Eisenhower and Churchill and those guys? Um, she says the monument was supposed to make people feel good about the Civil War. What? Is that what you think monuments are meant to do? Nobody feels good about the Civil War. What do you mean feels good about it? What, when have you ever heard that opinion expressed? What do you think about the Civil War? Oh, yeah, I felt great about it. I feel real great. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. So I feel good. Th that doesn't even make any sense. Okay, monuments don't exist to make us feel good about uh, it, the wars that they are remembering. But they do exist to remember because these are events that we should remember. People always say, happy dog, happy life. Well, if that's really the case, you need to be giving your dog rough greens. Naturopathic Dr. Dennis Black, the founder of Rough Greens, is focused on improving the health of every dog in America. Before I started feeding my dog rough greens, I had no idea that dog food is dead food. It contains very little nutritional value. Think about it. Nutrition isn't brown, it's green. Let rough greens bring your dog's food back to life. Rough greens is a supplement that contains all the necessary vitamins, minerals, probiotics, omega oils, digestive enzymes, and antioxidants that your dog needs. You don't have to go out and buy new dog food. You just sprinkle Rough Greens on their food every day. Dog owners everywhere are raving about Rough Greens. It supports healthy joints, improves bad breath, boosts energy levels, and so much more. We are wheat, and that goes for dogs too. Naturopathic Dr. Dennis Black is so confident Rough Greens will improve your dog's health. He's offering my listeners a free Jumpstart trial bag so your dog can try it. Get a free Jumpstart trial bag delivered straight to your door in just a few business days. Go to roughgreens.com slash Matt or call 844-ROUGH-700. That's R-U-F-F, greens.com slash Matt or call 844-ROUGH-700 today. 
Now, first of all, if Zion O'Brien looks familiar, and she does have a distinctive look, we must admit, that's because uh, you've probably seen her before on this show. Brian is the morbidly obese BLM activist who's officially sponsored by Dove, which is supposedly a brand that promotes personal health and beauty, but obviously doesn't anymore. Brian became famous for destroying the life of a University of Virginia student with a false accusation of racism. So that's the person that we're consulting on, on issues like this. But for a second, let's put aside what a horrible person Zion O'Brien is. Let's listen to the argument again that she was making two years ago on behalf of BLM. She's supposedly not objecting to the existence of the statue of Robert E. Lee, at least not explicitly. Instead, she's saying that it doesn't belong in a prominent public place, that it shouldn't stand in the center of parks towering over whole communities. She insists that there are, quote, whole museums that people can go to if they want to see statues like this one. Maybe people can even Google pictures of the statue if they're so inclined. Now, whatever the case, the argument was that uh, BLM isn't trying to erase history or denigrate this nation's heroes or mock white people for honoring one of the most brilliant generals in the history of the country. No, they're not doing any of that. They're just trying to put everything in its proper historical context. The Lee statue doesn't tell the story of the Confederacy failing, she complains, as if the role of a statue is to explain 19th century history in detail. Um, there were a lot of black people in Virginia, she goes on to say, and, and Lee was not black. And therefore, this statue needs to come down and go to a museum where it belongs. Now, none of that made any sense at the time, unless, of course, the goal was never to move the statue of Robert E. Lee, but instead to destroy it entirely. If that was the intent, then everything just went according to plan. As I said at the top, activists and university faculty members, with the help of local legislators, just melted down the statue of Robert E. Lee in secret in an undisclosed location after saying for years that they just wanted to move it to a museum. What they forgot to mention is that the museum they move it to is then going to take it and destroy it. Now, they won't even say what state uh, this, this destruction occurred in, but the leftists who demolished Lee's statue made sure to release a video of it happening. Here it is. Watch. Okay, so they not only removed the statue, they not only destroyed it, but they melted it and took a video of it and made sure to publish the video. They gave an inanimate statue of a Civil War general the Terminator treatment. They melted it down and filmed it. Now, why did they do that exactly? It, it wasn't to make the area safer for anyone. In fact, just a few days ago, a black male was murdered by another black male a short distance from where the statue used to be. So it doesn't seem like the area is now suddenly safer. So what's the real purpose of all this? Well, here's one big clue. All those images of, of the statue being melted down were accompanied by a lot of gloating. The Washington Post, for example, spoke to the executive director of Charlottesville Black History Museum, who said, quote, well, they can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. That's according to Andrea Douglas, the museum is, museum's executive director, as she watched pieces of oxidized metal descend into the furnace. Uh, there will be no tape for that, she says. The Post went on to interview another U of UVA activist behind this destruction who said, quote, Jelaine Schmidt, uh, who, this is reading now from the article, Jelaine Schmidt, who directs the memory project at UVA's Karsh Institute of Democracy, said she felt like she was preparing for an execution of sorts. Like if there's a rabid dog in the neighborhood that's been hurting people and it needs to be euthanized, she said. Schmidt also said, quote, we want to transform it into a piece of art that community can be proud of and gather around and not feel excluded or intimidated. Yes, because, of course, when you euthanize a rabid dog, you put it in a furnace and everyone gathers around and celebrates that they won't be intimidated anymore. OK, what kind of dog euthanasia has this person been a part of? But it all makes perfect sense, right? Turning the Lee statue into an inclusive art display, it's not a humiliation ritual at all, we're supposed to believe. We're also supposed to believe that the statue was hurting people. Well, how was it hurting people? What was it doing to them? Was it coming alive like night at the museum and assaulting innocent civilians in the middle of the night? What kind of damage was it causing? And, and why didn't anyone ever notice this damage or mention it for the first eight or nine decades of the statue's existence? Why are people in the 2020s more hurt by Civil War memorials than people who lived closer to the Civil War were? Okay, how did the wounds of the Civil War become fresher over time? 
How is some 20 something year old in the year 2023? Uh, how is it that 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 for them, it's like too soon for the civil war? We can't have civil war acknowledgement anywhere. It's too soon. And yet it wasn't in the 1930s or 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s. None of this makes any sense until you realize that the campaign to tear down Confederate statues was always, from the very beginning, a proxy in the overall war on American history. They just can't be honest about it because they, they're never honest about anything. And all the deception is necessary in this case because these activists have much bigger plans. They never planned to stop with melting down the Robert E. Lee statue, and they haven't. Indeed, the Lee statue is far from the only statue that's been destroyed, of course, or essentially destroyed in recent years. According to an investigation from the Madrid newspaper El País, the city of Richmond maintains a secret open-air graveyard for statues that were toppled in 2020. And these statues are disassembled and thrown into storage. A lot of contractors apparently passed on these disassembly gigs for obvious reasons. But eventually, Democrats in the state landed on a guy named Devin Henry, who, uh, who will, is willing to destroy them. Quoting from the investigation, Henry estimates that he has dismantled 24 structures between Richmond and Charlottesville. The latter is home to the University of Virginia and is one of the cities that acknowledged historical pain and chose to melt down and reuse the materials. Now, they've destroyed pretty much uh, every statue remotely associated with the Confederacy. And that includes a monument to Stonewall Jackson, who like Lee was a hero of the Mexican-American War. Widely regarded as one of the best military commanders in history. Devin Henry also dismantled a monument to the Confederate General A.P. Hill, who also distinguished himself in the war with Mexico. As El País reports, the statue of Hill now has its head, quote, dishonorably stuck in a tire waiting to be wrapped up in white plastic. All this to say, they're not putting any of these statues in museums. The museum gambit was always a lie. Something that only the most gullible among us could have ever fallen for. And sadly, there are a lot of gullible people among us. Now, that said, there's maybe one exception. The Jefferson Davis statue post-BLM riots uh, was taken down and, and was displayed in the Valentine Museum in Richmond. And this is how it's presented. You can see the picture here. Uh, toppled, desecrated, and covered in graffiti in the museum. There are many more examples, but you get the point. There was never any intention to memorialize history here, leftists are doing something to leaders of the Confederacy that they won't even do to Nazis. Okay, they're erasing them completely. I mean, you could still walk into the World War II Museum and see Nazi artifacts if you want, posters, flags, weaponry, even you know, Nazi games, board games. But they don't want you seeing any relics of the Confederacy under any circumstance, whether it's in a museum or not. In fact, even if you agree with removing the Lee statue in Charlottesville, which I don't, but even if you do, you must at least acknowledge that it is a historic artifact. It's literally registered as one. All of the controversy over it just makes it more historically significant. So there's no valid reason to destroy it. You are literally destroying history when you destroy it. And the destruction is a gratuitous act that can only be meant to send an ideological and political message. And this goes well beyond the Confederacy. That's why the mob quickly moved from the Confederacy to tearing down statues of, of pretty much any white person who happened to be born prior to the 20th century. Even Teddy Roosevelt fell victim. What this tells us is that leftists are preoccupied, above all, with erasing the history and traditions of this country. It's about power. It's about dominating and humiliating those that they identify as the enemy. And in large part, they are succeeding. We should remember that we're in this situation now because Republicans across the country, including in Washington, people calling themselves conservatives, that is, the people who are supposed to be conserving things like history, let it happen. They were too afraid of being called racist to say anything about it. They were too weak to stand up to this cultural vandalism when it took root. And they're still too weak to stand up for it or to it. If Republicans had any moral fortitude whatsoever, they would respond to the destruction of the Lee statue by painting over every George Floyd mural and tearing down and destroying every single one of his grotesque, disgusting monuments. If Robert E. Lee doesn't deserve to be honored, then a violent drug addict who, who robbed women and ripped off convenience stores certainly doesn't pass muster. So throw his busts and golden coffins in, in, in the furnace as well. But that won't happen, of course, because we've come a very long way since Eisenhower. Unfortunately, we're heading in the wrong direction. And frankly, at this point, it probably won't be long until Eisenhower's memorial is melted down too, especially after they see that video. 
They'll turn it into an inclusive art display, another display of inclusivity that excludes everyone who disagrees with them. That is the left's goal, after all. It's always been their goal. And if we keep electing politicians who are too afraid to say so, then ultimately they will achieve it. Hey, YouTube, thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like access to my full show with no ads, you should go to dailywire.com and use promo code Walsh to get two months free on all annual plans. See you there.